or whoever it is to start the recording. And then, Fira, you get rid of the blub. You're on mute, Fira. Apologies, I will do, Chair. That's the recording started now. So, um, welcome everyone to this meeting of the East Lothian IGLB on the 13th of December 2021, which is being held remotely in accordance with the Scottish Government's recommendations as regards physical distancing during the COVID-19 outbreak. This meeting is being recorded and will be made available as a webcast in order to allow the public access to the democratic process in East Lothian. East Lothian Council and NHS Lothian are the data controllers under the Data Protection Act 2018. Data collected as part of the recording will be retained in accordance with the Council and the Health Board's policies and record retention. And the webcast of this meeting will be publicly available for up to six months. And they'll take a roll call of attendees, so when you hear your name, if you could respond, please. Shimin Akhtar. Present. Sue Kempson. Present. Fiona O'Donnell. And I know Fiona is present, but I think she might be on the phone at the moment. A recorder is present. Um, Fiona Ireland. Richard Williams. Present. Peter Murray. Present. Maureen Allen. Present. Thank you. David Binney. Uh, David King. Present. Alison McDonald. Present. Claire McIntosh. Present. Thank you. Judith Tate. Present. John Turville. Present. And Leslie White. Okay. Um, we also have apologies from Neil Gilbert and Patricia Donald, voting members, and Phil Philip Conoglan, Lorraine Cowan, Ian Gorman, Marilyn McNeil, and Thomas Miller, who are all non voting members. Can I ask if any members have any declarations of interest to make on any of the items? No. No? That's great. We're ready to begin the business then, Chair. Great, so on to item one of the agenda, which is the minute of the meeting held on the 28th of October. So if we can, as normal, just invite any comments on its accuracy. I won't go through it page by page. If anybody has any issues I wish to raise, then please flag them to me now. If not, we'll go on to matters arising. I'm not seeing MD, am I, am I missing MD? If you are, just shout, because sometimes I occasionally miss, but I can't see any hands up. So I'm going to assume that we are happy with the minute as presented and um, saying that off is accurate. So we'll now go through it for uh, matters arising, if we can, and we will do this by page. So we'll start with page two. Just again, put your hand up, please, if there's anything you wish to um, Comment on page three, page four, page five, and lastly, page six. So no indications, so thank you for that. We'll now move on to the chair's report which will be uh, very brief uh, in this occasion because uh, I've just got uh, one thing that you may be of uh, maybe interest to you to, to let you know that I am um, through the, the chair of chairs and vice chairs of IGBs I've been uh, offered a place on the National Care Service Stakeholder Forum which um, I think will be helpful uh, in a number of respects because obviously it will keep uh, me in touch with what's going on from uh, as close a perspective as I can get. Uh, I've got nothing more to share with you other than to tell you that, that has happened. Um, and of course, it's out of the context, arguably, of this particular role. Uh, it'll do no harm uh, for me to, where appropriate, feedback to you, some information as it becomes available to me. I wonder, Shemin, uh, is there anything from the cause of the Health and Social Care Board you wish to share, or was, or, or was, it, um, was there not much of a 
and um, we got I'll circulate their presentation. The Carers Trust carried out a piece of research on the impact of COVID and carers, um, and that was that that was going to be circulated. So we did ask for examples of good practice where it was possible to drill drill further down on that research. But I'm happy to to circulate that. Thank you, Shireen. Okay, um, Alison, do you want to add anything? I probably wouldn't know where to start today, Peter. <laughs> um, I, I suppose um, maybe just very briefly, if you, if um, a quick update on the vaccination programme, if uh, the IGB would like that. Um, I know we've got Care at Home coming up later, um, a paper specifically on that. It's a huge challenge at the moment and we're really concerned about that. So we, we'll cover that under the paper. Um, obviously, huge pressures on the system, the, the whole, the wider NHS social care system um, today, not getting any worse, um, not getting any better, certainly, um, as, as we move into the festive period. So huge, huge workforce, pre workforce pressures and huge pressures on beds, system and services. So um, I'm sorry to start with a, 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 that that's the way things are. On the vaccination programme, um, you would see there's been quite a flurry of activity around um, the, the changes in the vaccination programme, some of which caught us um, probably a bit of a surprise. Um, around the 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 um the, the drop-ins and the 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 that were announced at the weekend there's a um there's been a significant ask to increase our vaccination um activity a significant ask um before Christmas and by the end of January to get through the booster program um which really will look to us trebling if not you know um more our efforts that we're currently undertaking. Um, we have a, a proposal on the table, um, which I hope will come to fruition by the end of the t today or early tomorrow, around using another facility in East Lothian to consolidate our, our vaccination programme on one site, but on a site that will give us the ability to increase our activity, staff dependent, but will give us that ability to increase um, our activity um, and also the potential for people if we do end up with a queue for queues to be inside at the weekend, especially on Saturday, we had real high activity at the community hospital. The community hospital um, appointments were all booked out. We were already booked um, fully for Saturday. And then there was some misunderstandings that that was actually a drop in session. And we had a significant number of people who turned up for a drop in session to a clinic that was already fully booked. Um, so that that led to you know some obvious concern from the people that were queuing because there's no place to queue inside at the community hospital, um, and it also led to some some of our volunteer um, helpers in particular um, being a bit upset. Um, so um, we're, we're we're taking steps to make sure that we can move to a, a facility that will hopefully give us that will will give us the capacity to better manage that. Um, hopefully from the beginning of next week. So um, big ask and um, Krista and the team are working and we've got a couple, couple more meetings today about how we could potentially resource and staff that. So you will, there will be information comes out in the next week. I can't say any more around the legalities of leases and things, but there will be something comes out within the next 40 hours around um, increasing the capacity for vaccinations in East Lothian. Um, I don't know if people potentially are interested. We had Gold Command, as agreed last Thursday. Gold Command have um, an NHS Lothian that manages um, operational emergency issues during um, the, this period. Um, we, we took the um, situation at the Eddington Hospital with the temporary relocation of the beds to East Lothian Community Hospital, and that was continued. Um, but we did agree to review that on a monthly basis moving forward. So there'll be a review um, middle to end of January around that situation again. Thanks, Peter. Thanks so much, Alison. <clears throat> it's um, the vaccine. I don't, I, 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 I don't uh, understand the challenge. I don't pretend to understand the challenge the vaccination is going to present because it's clearly going to be a big one based on the, the growth that was announced. If we assume that the Correlation between England and Scotland is, is as Boris outlined yesterday. They were doubling at least the the um, the need to vaccinate people in that short space of time. So 
Um, well done to all those that have done what they've done, but um, it's going to be um, a, re a resource challenge, I'm sure, and people's understanding of it is clearly going to be a challenge in itself, because I know a number of people think that every centre is just a drop-in, and they just arrive there uh, hoping to get seen. Um, and the problem I think we've got is that some get taken and some don't. So uh, yeah. certainly not that that's the case. It's been the same all over then. People who've turned up at the right time for their, their appointment are having to queue because there's people who have dropping in um, are in front in the queue and you can understand that people are getting frustrated. We're, well, we're very frustrated over the weekend by that. Um, but we had a lot of discussion this morning around comms around that. So we'll try and make sure that it's very clear um, to people what needs to happen. Any questions for Alison before we move on? No, not seeing any. Okay, that takes us to uh, agenda item number four, which is the membership of East Lothian. Uh, Fiona, are, are you covering this paper? Uh, yes, I'm happy to cover it here. Um, it's just a brief report to confirm the reappointment of Neil Gilbert as a voting member of the IGB uh, on behalf of East Lothian Council. Uh, the Council is um, the body that points its own voting members as NHS Lothian does, so it's not for the IGB to formally approve the appointment, really just to note it. So um, if members are happy to note the recommendations. And that's Neil's reappointment. That's great, thank you very much. Great, thank you Fiona. Okay, that takes us to some of the more substantive items now, which uh, begin with the financial update which David, I'm assuming you're presenting. Yes, dear. Uh, thank you very much. There's, I'll, I'll, I'll try and sort of gather all these bits together, uh, hopefully quite, quite succinctly. There's, there's three parts to this paper. The first part is really looking at the winter funding. And you can see there's two appendices to the back of the paper. And those are letters from the Scottish Government laying out a whole string of, of ambitions and the resources to deliver these ambitions. And it's kind of split into three parts. There's there's money for what they term interim care, which is try and support and tackle the flow issues around the acute hospitals, which we've discussed many times around this table. There's quite a considerable amount of, of investment in social care. There's a lot of money, as you can see, for care at home. And there's also money will be made available to increase the pay for those members, so those people who work for social care providers. So the minimum amount at this particular point in time was uh, £9.50. There's ambition here for us to move that up to £10 and tuppence. And we'll come back to that in a minute. And the sort of mechanism for these things is, is a wee bit more complicated. And the third thing is a further investment in the multidisciplinary teams. Now, that, that's relatively straightforward. You've seen the letters, you can see what goes on here. There is an issue, or there was a potential to have an issue around the governance. And a lot of my colleagues, not, I should add, uh, locally, but a lot of my colleagues are very concerned about how this money flows around the system. So they, the money goes to the council, the council then should formally give it to the IGB, the IGB should then accept it and formally give it to the Health and Social Care Partnership, who of course are delivering all of these things. Or in fact, to be absolutely fair, the councils are making the payments to the providers, but that mechanism works away in the background. Now, people were concerned, you know, what's the meeting schedule? How are we going to get this through governance? This is quite frankly a piece of absolute nonsense. So the Section 95 officer in the council, Sarah Fortune, simply wrote to me and said, look, here's the money. Council will give the IGB the money. And as the Section 95 officer of the IGB, I said, thank you very much. That's excellent. We will give that money to the Health and Social Care Partnership, e.g. Alison. Now, of course, I discussed this with Peter, with Fiona and with um, Alison and said, you know, that's what we'll do. So but for the purpose of governance, the IJB, because the IJB, of course, has accepted the offer from its partners for the beginning of this financial year, it's accepted the offer from both partners. Uh, so that for purposes of governance, the IGB needs to accept this offer and give the money to the Health and Social Care Partnership. So that, that is part of the ambition around the winter funds. I think there's a very serious concern, of course, about the pressures in the system. And when you think about all the pressures that we have, and there are serious, serious cost pressures now developing the system. Quite rightly, we're investing more money in the staff, and that's absolutely the right thing to do. <clears throat> but what that means is you're paying more money to do the same thing. 
and there's a significant amount of demand pressures out there and there's a significant range of, of pressures in social care of which we are aware. So there's a tiny, tiny concern, although in fact it's a significant concern, that although this seems a significant amount of money, by the time we've managed all the pressures, there may not be terribly much left. And I'll come back to that in a minute. The third part, sorry, the second part of this paper is about the outturn. So clearly we make an outturn forecast on a regular basis. We come back to the IGB and say this is the budget. This is what it looks like during the year. So you can see what it says there. I, I think we're kind of creeping towards a roughly break even position, although I absolutely accept there's a lot of significant concerns currently in the social care budget. And I know the health and social care partnership management team is working very, very hard on that. But come back to the winter money. There is no way we are going to spend this year's winter allocation before the 31st of March. No way at all. Therefore, the IJB will be underspent. So the important thing is to say, what does that underspend mean? Is that an underspend simply a function of the fact that we're carrying all this money forward? Or is that an underspend based on the recurrent operational baselines that we have? And that, I hope, segues us on to the third point of this paper, which is to ask the IGB support to have a finance workshop in their January's meeting. And I think there's two objectives for that finance workshop, two quite important objectives. The first objective, if I could just find it, because I wrote it down, <coughs> excuse me, is that when we sit down and look at the offer from the partners for 22-23, we understand the totality of the position. We understand how our budgets are arrived at. We've had an opportunity to look at all the pressures, look at all the issues, look at all the new money on the table and have a very, very, very clear um, totality of the whole overall financial position. And therefore, when we sit down at that meeting in April or May, or whenever we sit down to look at <clears throat> what the offers are, we know exactly what we are expecting and therefore exactly how we reflect upon these offers. And in fact, the Scottish budget has, sorry, the Scottish government has since published its budget and has since published the guidelines about what the offers should look like. So all of that information will be available to us. And I would like to think that we can use that workshop, first of all, just to remind ourselves of what all the bits and pieces are, but secondly, to have a, a detailed discussion on what we think about these things and how we reflect upon what these positions. In actual fact, I was at a briefing about the Scottish Government's budget the other day, and <clears throat> what it says for health, for example, all the boards get a 2% uplift and they will receive money to cover the costs of the hike in national insurance contributions caused by the uh, government's change in national insurance regulations. So that's absolutely fine. Uh, what else is somebody? Isn't inflation running in the region of 5% and health inflation is generally higher than overall inflation? So this 2% compared to overall inflation of 5% will create a significant challenge. And you do not need me to remind you that we are currently sitting on mountains of expenditure to support the whole COVID pandemic. And it is clear from all the briefings that it's going to be extraordinarily challenging for the government, governments plural, both UK government and our local government, to continue to fund all that COVID expenditure at the current rates of expenditure. So I'm not trying to, to I'm not trying to um, sort of say what we're going to discuss at this workshop in January, but I'm just trying to flag up some of the issues and give you a chance to think about these things. I'm also trying to brief you and, and share with you what I know. And the second objective from the workshop is to go back and look once again at the way in which we are structured to work and say to ourselves, well, we need to map our strategies onto our budgets or map our budgets onto our strategies, whichever way you want to look at it, to map that onto our strategic plan and therefore, when we have a strategic plan and a financial plan that supports the delivery of that strategic plan, that we have directions which have budgets attached to them. So in a perfect world, the direction would say, I would like to do these things using this resource. And then whoever's delivering that particular direction for us would come back and say, I have done these things using that particular resource. And we would have a nice um, as I say, this is a highly, highly perfect world. We would have a nice, clear way of monitoring our directions. So I've probably spoken for too long, but I hope I've covered the points I'm asking the IGB to look at in my paper. Alison, did you want to add anything before we've got questions? Or are you happy just to leave it at that? 
No, I'm happy just to leave it at that. I think the important thing is this year that we have the the development session in a timely manner to allow us then to consider the budgets as they come in, Peter. So I think that'll be that'll be preferable. Okay, thank you. Any questions for David on his paper and his presentation? Fiona. Thank you very much and thank you um, for that presentation, David. I wanted to ask these letters which are coming in sort of with budget offers and talking about processes, why why are the IGB chairs not included in the distribution list for those letters? Um, you, you may not be able to answer that, but it seems to me there is a gap here, and especially in relation to the guidance, that for those of us who are councillors, we're going to be making decisions about budgets. And you know, while I have complete confidence in the Section 95 officers of both the council and the IGB, it's really important that councillors have this information in front of them when they're deciding on budgets. Um, but I, I just think you know, we keep being told IGBs need to do more, step up, but not to have that information shared directly with the chair is, is a gap in the kind of the governance and the process. So any comments, I suppose, is the question. Well, I, I, don't, know, I don't know the question. I don't know the answer to the question, Fiona, however, uh, there's, there's a National Chief Finance Officers Network which is meeting on Thursday and I will see at the time that I have been asked this question. Now the Scottish Government attend these networks and are, and are they're policy leads um, and in actual fact the Director of Finance is attending the network as well, the Scottish Government's Director of Finance. So I'll just make the comment and ask that in future these letters be copied to chairs and I guess then that they you make a really interesting point whether they do that or not, I will copy the letters onto the chair from now on. I know also wants to come in on this, but just quickly before you go, also, interestingly, uh, David, I, I attended a meeting with uh, some Scottish government colleagues and uh, in this other role that I performed, which is relevant to, to here, because the question I was asked, and I said this to Alison a few weeks ago, was what could we do to help facilitate the governance of the very point you've made about the salary increase? But yet, as it stands, I knew nothing of it because I didn't receive the letter. So, Alison, did you want to come in on this particular point or is that a separate point? No, just on that point, I think it was certainly something that came up last year, given the, the discussions about the budget offer letters. Um, and, and the answer I got back was that it was for the council as a council and the health board as a health board. They were the organisations who made the offer to the IGB. It wasn't the IGB that were... Um, making the offer, but I, I again we we shared it with IGB members. I think that the the challenge there, David, was around the wider councillors who weren't included. You know, so so it, you know it was people, the councillors were then having to make a decision without the information um, being distributed. But it also goes to the local authority chief executives. So I think I think Fiona's right. It'd be really good for us to get a clear governance around that so that we're, we're, we're all very clear that, that it's op as open and transparent as it can be. Absolutely. So I think it'd be good to get that back. Thanks, uh, Alison. Uh, Maureen, you your hand up. Has your question been addressed? I'll assume it has, Maureen. What about, yeah, I, can't, I was doing the piece, so it's fine. Yeah, OK. Richard. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, obviously, we, we welcome the money. Uh, new additional money is always welcome, particularly in this kind of crisis. It's just kind of a daft laddie question, if I may. I mean, reading the letters, it seems pretty clear that the money is being directed through the Council for spend on predominantly social care. But as an IJB, do we not have the legislative right to decide how we spend the money? So we could actually wire this across and to increase health spend if we felt necessary and appropriate. I'm just a bit confused by the kind of strings attached to this and, and how that conflicts with what we might choose to do with the money. As we increase carers and care hour provision, that does tend to produce an increased demand on health services. I mean, quite rightly, carers have a, a low threshold for referral to the primary care team. But, you know, increasing carers hours is great, but there is an impact on health services. And unless there's kind of money's coming to support that, we might choose to use this money slightly differently. I'm just not clear about that in my own head. Do you want me to, yeah, 
Richard, you're absolutely right. And I, I would say one of the things that East Lothian IGB have always been very good at, and we've learned over the last couple of years, is just how to do that, to make sure that... So, And the letter actually, it, it makes clear that the totality of the money to, is to be used to the best outcomes for the local population so that, that and it gives the chief officer the ability to to, to look at the, the the local situation and change that and obviously coming through strategic planning group and igb etc but i mean i mean i think one of the things we've talked about here and we'll, we'll, we've developed over the years of the hospital to home and our in-house at least loading council home care service so my my thoughts would be that we would bring a paper to the igb who would hopefully support us to develop um, services differently as long as it was meeting that care at home um, that care at home envelope and it may be some some to third sector it may be some to um, the, and, and I'm keen you know the infrastructure of supporting the services so you, you, you're right and I think East Lothian have been particularly good at enabling us to move that money around and supporting supporting us so I would hope that yeah that would continue. That's very helpful and I look forward to seeing the paper. Thank you. That's great. Okay. Any other questions? Well, I've got a couple. Shireen. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm really glad to see that the both sections, 75 officers have um, worked together to try and um, you know to get this money to where it's needed the most as quickly as possible. So that's 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 welcome and I really appreciate those efforts by by the officers, but I, what, uh, that's what we want to see in, in, the, in the next paper, which we'll see that I, we're in a really difficult situation. But what I just wanted to flag it, you asked me if I'd raised any issues at the health, the cause of my health and social care partnership. Um, and one of the things I did raise is when you're reading all of these papers and you read Laura's paper as well, that even when um, winter problems were being raised in July, just that why, why and the system wasn't quick enough to get the get those resources out and to get that money out to specifically social care staff. And I'm not sure if you're able to comment of how quickly they will receive that. I think it comes to 50 the 52 pence additional cost of how quickly they'll they'll get that through the system. And the other thing I just wanted to flag up on appendix annex A was the volume of staff and the NRAC shares. Will that be based on the, the, the formula that, that unfortunately disadvantages NHS Lothian, or uh, I'm assuming that's the formula that ha is used here, or it, would it be uh, anything different? Also, you come in on this one. I was going to come in on the um, I was going to come in on getting the money through, and then I was going to look to David for an explanation of NRAC if that was okay. Um, <laughs> I, as far as the money going through, the, the teams are working on it as we speak, Shamine, and as soon as they can get that money through, it will be out. It's the it's the physical ability. And I see Laura's got her hands up to to process the transaction, so there there is work ongoing. Um, we were asked for December, but we always thought December would be a challenge and that it would more likely be January. But Laura might give you an update on that. Yeah, so so Alison's right. Um, it will be the end of January, most likely before the, the money is in um, people's accounts. And our particular um, concern is those people who have PA employers, so direct payments. Um, so we, lots of processes to do in the background, which takes resource. But the other important thing to remember is that the providers um, must agree to the uplift and some may not. So we have to wait for them to make a return to us and um, to say that they're accepting the money and they will pay their staff at £10 and 2 pence. That's easier for our contracted framework providers in the care homes, but a bit more of a challenge for the smaller care home provision, day centres um, and, and the other uh, frontline staff. So end of January, all being well. Laura, can I ask you a supplement to that, please, just while you're speaking about it? If they were on something more than £9.50 per hour already, are they getting the corresponding increase, if, even if it takes them to more than £10.2 pence an hour? Yes. So they, so everybody will get the same percentage uplift, which was 86% for non-residential, for some complex arrangement. But yes, everybody, even if they're already paying their staff more, or £10.02, they still get the uplift. And the difficulty comes that, that although they raise, for example, they raise their frontline staff to £10.02, that may mean that somebody 
uh, uh, else within their organisation no longer is paid more than that member of staff. And therefore, they have to also uplift those members of staff to keep their grading correct and the structure correct. So that's the challenge for some of the organisations um, that are paying, already paying £10 and two pence. Yeah. And has that been fed back to the Scottish Government, that particular challenge? Um, I think Scotland XL, who are dealing with the care home side of things, will have fed that back, and we have certainly fed that back. Um, our procurement officer has certainly said, fed that, that back. Thanks, Laura. Um, Shereen, your hand's still up. Is, it, is that from the last time? Sorry, yeah, that's from the last time, Chair. So, Maureen, please. Hi, thanks, thanks, Peter. It's, it's a comment, and I think it's just really for noting. Ten pound and two pence is not going to make the slightest bit of difference to these workers. Not one iota. They're still going to be leaving in droves. There's restaurants paying eleven pound an hour. So why would you go and work in care when you can go and do a nighttime job serving people for eleven pound? Um, and uh, it's just really important that that people get that. This is not going to solve anything short term, medium term, or probably long term. Yeah, I think um, that's a comment I've heard a few times, uh, Maureen. Not, not unsurprising. Uh, I think when you when you start to see the airing publicly of salaries that are available elsewhere in what people might consider to be more straightforward roles, if that's the best way to describe it. Uh, less less challenging. Want me to come back on the the NRAC thing while we're here? Sorry, Chair. Sorry, 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 David. Yes, please. I, I, I was just looking at this again. I th <clears throat> There's a whole string of bits and pieces to this. One of which was an additional one thousand band threes and fours, which was supposed to be spread between all the boards, and it, that. I was just adding the column up. That that is what that NRAC share is. The NRAC share is is the numbers of additional band threes and fours. Now that is not part of those letters. That's a separate thing. Although the letters do mention it, I know it's extremely complicated. My understanding of of the allocations on the letters themselves is that, and I appreciate what we've just said about the payments from nine pounds fifty to ten pounds and tuppence. That's done in actuals. Although another letter has been issued allocating money with the, the caveat that if this is not enough, then ask us for more. And other elements of it are done in JAE, which is the council model, which I guess East Lothian Council is not benefiting from either because its population is increasing. So Shamin makes a very, very powerful point. The, the share models are disadvantaging us um, because our populations are growing. But, you know, I... I, I we can we can certainly discuss these things and the impacts that they have on, on their general financial um, pressures when we have the finance workshop. But I think that that's just a wee bit of a red herring. I think it's just about the additional thousand workers. Okay. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> and if I maybe ask a, a daft Lassie question. Um, so if a provider is paying already more than 10.02, do they have to pass this money on to the staff in whole? And if they don't, presumably that money is returned to us. And do we then have to return it to the Scottish Government? I see Laura nodding to all of that. Yes, Laura. Is that yes to all yes, those sorry, questions? Yes, sorry, that was yes to all those questions. So yes, they must pass it on. If they do not, they must return. Well, they shouldn't accept it and we would make a return to the Scottish Government. And the auditing of that, Laura, how's that going to be done? Through our skillful financial team and our planning and performance team. And, and just quickly, supplementary, can I ask if any providers are saying that they are actually being um, you know, disadvantaged because they've chosen to provide a, a higher level of salary and that, you know, to use this maybe to, to you know, in other ways, but has there been any kind of response from them, Laura? So nothing that I have seen formally, informally, um, there has been with a couple of providers who already pay significantly over £10 and two pence are, are saying, look, if, if we do this, we cannot, yeah, it, it doesn't work for us. 
So we need to make sure that when we're presenting that, we are saying you're getting this because you're already paying that amount, um, but we can't allow you to keep it and therefore increase your profit. So we have one or two providers um, in, in that position, probably one only in East Lothian, but we all work with, with those, that individual provider. Okay, um, my question, David uh, or Alison, is um, of the figures, uh, accepting the point that, that you responded to Richard's question on, Alison, that you may alter how the spend actually works, but on the assumption that there was an expectation that those three headings, interim care arrangements, care at home capacity and multidisciplinary teams, was where you would try to target the money, how much of it what proportion of it are we going to be able to spend and what of the outcomes that are in within the letters are we able to report back on as a consequence of the money that you will spend? Well, I think we could spend that quite easily, Peter. I think we could easily spend the money. What we will spend this year will depend on recruitment, but we're already starting to recruit into our services. Um, but we, we have proposals that will that will touch most of the money. Um, we, we, we definitely need to, to increase our care at home capacity if we're going to do, you know, um, stop doing residential care and, and, and not stop doing it, but reduce residential care and allow people to be cared for in the community, which is what we're about, then we have to increase our care at home capacity. People are becoming much more, are, are living at home, as we've talked about here a few times, with much more complex needs. So the needs of them and, and the, the need, what they need at home is obviously as well getting more complex. So, um yeah, that, that money um, will go very quickly. Um, and um, we, we may have a bit of a lag this year, but once we get up and running, then um, I, I, I would suspect we will spend that money easily and double it if we could, if we had that. And under the headings that are, are, are identified. So we will be able to, um, we will always have to go back and report back. That's the other thing. We will be expected to report back on our achievements against those headings. So when I say we're able to kind of move it about, we're able to move it about as long as we're achieving the outcomes that will be required of those headings. So it's not a kind of free for all. Yeah, so that on that point, could we reasonably assume as an IGB that we would equally get a response to the measures that are within the letter? Oh yeah, absolutely. To indicate, to, yeah. to indicate to IGB how what effect it's having. Because I think that would be I think that would be appropriate because if we're okay. going to tie this into a financial workshop in January, then you assume that those areas that they are looking to have reported back, we equally share an interest in those. Oh no, ab absolutely, Peter. And when we bring the paper forward around how the money will be, you know, proposals for spending it and what we propose to do and how you, we will obviously tie that back to the um, what, any KPIs, uh, et cetera, and make sure that, that that's part of our report. Yeah. Thanks, Alison. Richard, you want to come back in? Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, I mean, the complexity of the situation and the unintended consequences, particularly because we're so reliant on private sector provision. I'm not sure <laughs> I need an answer just now, but are we at any point going to be reviewing our reliance on the private sector provision? And will we be looking to change the ratio of directly employed staff compared to I say maybe don't need to give a definitive answer just now, but are are we going to be reviewing it? Is that, that I think I think, Laura's I got think an answer for you. Laura will answer that one, but absolutely we have to um any slowing, we definitely have to do something here. Yeah. yeah, so I feel like everybody is stealing my care at home thunder for my paper coming up, but that's all right, Richard. Um I think, yes, so we will, and I will go into that in a little bit more detail of the paper, just um, noting Maureen's comment on the side there about the, you know, the, the constant market pool between our internal and external services, and that is something we are very mindful of, um, and how there is room for both, and how we do something differently in both sectors. Um, so yes, that, that is being reviewed and looked at, but it's not, unfortunately, as straightforward as just building up our internal service. And I think what's also really important to note is there are no more people, and that's that's the difficult bit. And um, we get efficiencies from having an internal service and managing or having more control over an internal service. But I'm not sure I could say how much capacity as a whole that will bring in, but it does bring efficiencies in terms of delivery. 
It's not stealing your thunder, Lord. I look forward. <laughs> it's like a, a, a preview. Would it? I, I just wanted to, to bring up, I mean, we need to also be looking at, you know, our communities and what the communities can do for themselves. And, and I don't want to to take anything away from Laura's paper whatsoever, <laughs> but we do need to start thinking. I mean, I was, I'm was i actually reading the, the plan, the strategic plan, because I'm pulling a paper together um, for 17-2022. And actually the IGB hasn't mentioned communities as a section on its own at all in that plan. So that would be something that I would be really keen to to see in the next uh, version of the plan. But everybody's talking about community resilience, community capacity, what can the community do for itself? We've become over, overly reliant on the services doing to us. We need to start encouraging people to do for themselves as well. So that's my tuppence worth. Yeah, I think that's a good point, uh, Maureen. So that, that, thanks for raising it. I'm sure Paul has already got that in his line of sight and he's thinking about the next version of the strategic plan. If he hasn't, he has now. OK, are we all done in questions on this one? Because we've got to go to a roll call for two, one, two, three and four, which I will invite Fiona to do. Fiona, if you wouldn't mind. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, the recommendations in the report um, 2.11 is to note the outturn position um, and 2.123 and 4 are to accept the additional winter funding, direct the additional winter funds and agree to use a workshop in January to consider the financial plan. So when I call your name, if you could indicate voting members which way you would like to vote. Uh, Shamin Akhtar. Support. Sue Kempson. Support. Fiona O'Donnell. Support. Do we have Fiona Ireland present now? I don't think we do. Um, Peter Murray. Support. Richard Williams. Support. And do we have Neil Gilbert present? I don't think Yes, we do. I'm here. I think he had enough of that to support it as well. Thank you, Neil. Um, that's the recommendations approved unanimously, Chair. Thank you. And Neil, you'd be glad in your absence that you were uh, you were uh, approved to remain on the IGB, so you'd be very pleased to hear that, I'm sure. Thank you so much for that, Peter. OK, we shall move on now to thank you, David and Alison and Laura for all your contributions there. Um, We'll move on now to the next paper, which um, we've had a little bit of trailing of. So, uh, item six, Care at Home Services, East Lothian, and yourself, Laura. Okay, thank you. Um, so I suppose, yes, just mindful that some people have heard a lot of this paper in other groups, um, and we are well aware of, of the crisis. Um, due to social and, and national media. Um, I suppose my, my plea is that we don't become complacent hearing it. Sometimes when you hear these things over and over again, it, you kind of almost can stop listening. And I think actually my thoughts are today is that we keep listening because it's getting worse and the severity is worse and the associated risks of a severe crisis are, are increasing. So I just have that in the back of my mind. And I suppose I ask you to also note that yeah we, we don't stop listening and um, because it, it does feel like we are yeah not out of the woods and can barely see the light however we have had some solutions we do put uh, mitigations in place and this paper uh, will talk through some of those as well as highlighting those those risks so the recommendations were to to note the content of the report uh, to offer the continued support to the partnership staff as they work under significant pressure to deliver care at home services. And that's not only our care at home services themselves, but also the support that, that goes around those services. And to note the uh, to note NHS Lothian's goal directive um, to move people who are clinically fit for discharge um, in hospital, uh, but are awaiting a care at home package, um, to move them into an interim care home place um, this is something that, that does happen when people are looking for a care home bed on a permanent places, but a new position um, for people that are waiting for care at home services. So people able to go home with care, but we simply don't have the care for them. They are going into an interim care bed 
um, to, while they wait for a package of care. So uh, just go into the, so sorry, just to note that recommendation, I'll talk a bit more about that particular recommendation in the paper. Um, so the to note the, the current situation, um, to remind us all that the service provision for care at home is set against a, an agreed criteria where, whereby only needs assessed if substantial and critical are met by a regulated care at home service. So just a reminder that it's currently substantial and critical that we are able to deliver to. Um, so, as uh, Shimin said earlier, we have been responding to this crisis since the summer, if not a little bit before the summer, um, and the situation has continued to deteriorate. Uh, such is the chronic shortage of care at home services. Um, as I've just explained, the directive from NHS Lothian to move people into interim care at home uh, or care home beds as they await care homes. Uh, as they await a care at home package. We are keeping these individuals under constant review and um, uh, they are still open for allocation of care at home and they are still seen as a very high priority. It is not um, recommended and it's not something we want to do to have people who are fit and able to be at home to be in a care home place. That's not the best choice for them, but is what's required to keep the system moving and to keep hospital beds free. Um, we have set up a daily care at home huddle, or this was set up, I think, probably in August. Um, so the huddle meets daily to look at um, all current crisis. So all care at home providers um, plan a, a strategy for how we can, can respond to the crisis and also how we can respond to our individual providers. Um, we had done all this already, but the, the Scottish Government also asked that we set up a weekly care at home oversight group, um, which is the senior managers within the partnership who take a strategic uh, overview and are able to make decisions based on the information they get from the daily huddles. So just to, for those that don't know, give a bit of background onto the care at home service within East Lothian. As Richard pointed out earlier, we have 92% um, of our care at home services delivered by the independent sector. And this does place us at um, further risk in terms of management of care at home provision. So where um, partnerships uh, have um, a higher level of internal care at home service, what that provides is better control over how you direct that care. Whilst we contract out 92% of our services, it means that we have less control over where to send those carers and how to send them. Um, so if we've got a crisis emerging in Dunbar, but all our carers happen to be in Musselburgh, or we have capacity of, of, of care in Musselburgh, we are able to, to, to provide transport and move those care staff over to Dunbar. The independent sector don't have always such um, terms and conditions that allow that to happen and therefore we don't have that efficiency that we can always that we get within our internal service. So East Lothian delivers uh, care at home to uh, 1,216 people and 68 percent who are over 65 so majority of our service users are over 65 so 20,000 hours of support each week. Uh, we have 12 care at home providers, six delivering to people over 65 on a sort of time and task model. So they are uh, assessed and then um, uh, contracted to deliver 15 minutes for medication or half an hour for personal care. Uh, we have our two internal services, so home care um, and our hospital to home. Uh, the latter supporting people out of hospital, the former those within the community. We also have an emergency care service um, who's design, who was designed to respond to people who fall, um, but also now pick up the majority of our palliative care cases, allowing people, if they wish to, um, die at home. So the quality of care by the independent and third sector is closely monitored and on the whole um, is to a very high standard. However, the number of providers competing with each other for care staff and care packages has meant the efficiency of which care at home can be delivered is compromised. And unfortunately, with the current um, pressures, the, the quality uh, is also being compromised, particularly when, when um, care is not being delivered um, and services are missed. 
We've had one small uh, off framework uh, provider has ceased to exist and that put additional pressure on our framework providers as well as um, the other off framework providers as, as they're known. Uh, the internal service has been gradually increasing since 2019, but recruitment is slow and lengthy process. And although the internal services has increased by around 200 hours per week, the external provision has decreased by nearly 1000 hours per week. I think I wrote this paper maybe two or three weeks ago to get in for submission. That those hours will have changed. Um, I don't think recruitment particularly increased, but the number of hours um, that we are purchasing has decreased simply because we cannot provide it. So the uh, two graphs show the decrease in um, hours. Um, you can see the gradual picture since 2015. It's 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 uh, of of provision going down, um, but particularly over a, April November for our external providers is shown in the second graph. Um, so that's not including our internal services. The the table shows the full provision for over 65s going down from 9,000 in uh, July down to 8,400 hours. Um, so about 20 less people um, being uh, receiving care at home services. Uh, learning disability providers also are suffering and are within the same, um, uh, suffering with the same, the same pressures. Um, it's not been as dramatic there and that's partly because of the way that their services are delivered in that many of them are are 24 hour care packages or large blocks of daytime support and um, so there has been more flex within within their services and um, to help manage this crisis however they will still report um, a high level of frontline staff being absent and um, full time not being able to be delivered to the individual but whereas for uh, over 65s, that can mean a whole visit is missed for potentially people with learning disabilities. Sometimes that means that the care is reduced by an hour or, or, uh, or on either side of a, of a full day. So not ideal, but just different in their, um, in their service delivery. So the lack of care staff, um, just going through some of the reasons um, for why we are finding ourselves within the current crisis. Um, the pandemic is partly to play. Um, the really staff finding just, just burnt out, exhausted. Um, as Maureen has, has highlighted, the lack of pay, the lack of the poor terms and conditions have over a period of time left us in this situation. Um, we also, of course, as Alison pointed out, we have an increase in demand for that service. We are trying to make people, um, trying to allow people to stay at home for longer. We are um, focused on people being supported within their community, um, and we are asking more of our care at home provisions. So, whereas um, maybe 10, 11, 12 years ago, there was an element of home help. There was an element of going in and checking somebody was okay. There was an element of of social support. Um, that is no longer the case and we are very much asking people to go in to support individuals who have in many cases uh, a clinical need for care, uh, catheter care, stoma care, uh, medication. Um, so a, a very different picture to, to 10, 12 years ago. Um, there, uh, just to reiterate, the average of 25% of frontline staff are absent across all providers um, with a range of 10 to 43% at one time. And, you know, we are getting that information from our providers and it is being, we are trying to support them on a daily basis, hour by hour, to, to um, ensure that all service users are receiving some form of support. Uh, this has been touched on previously, so I'm not going to go into this in, in detail, just the money that has become available um, for uh, care at home or for social care and to try and manage the crisis. But, you know, the shortfall in that and the lateness that that has arrived with us to, to implement changes as they're required now. Um, so just on to 3.22, while the staffing challenges require ongoing national approach, we are continually working to develop solutions locally to address the challenges outlined above. 
So the following have been put in place. We have tried and continue to, to cluster our providers to reduce their travel time um, to, to try and get as much care out of the system as possible. We are constantly um, looking at uh, the rehabilitation um, approach. The, we are using OTs to look at where we have double up care um, and if that can be reduced down to single care safely and effectively. Um, we have increased uh, clarity uh, for all our uh, health and social care staff with regards to outcomes and eligibility for care at home. Um, the discussion this morning about we still have um, staff who will, uh, trying to think of the appropriate phrase, who will put, put more than is required in order to get something. Um, uh, so over egg the pudding um, and that's not helpful and I think what we we do constantly do and we do need to remind staff is there is nothing available so what is available must only go to those that have the most need so it's about working with our colleagues to get that message across and also to make sure that we don't over prescribe is the wrong word but I can, can't think of an over assess um, care um, it, it's not in the individual's best interest and it doesn't um, meet the needs of, of those with, with the greatest needs. We have um, and continually update the RAG status of each individual so we know the people that are at highest risk. Um, we do the same for our providers and we do um, daily contact with our providers to assess with them how um, at what level of risk they are at in terms of service delivery. We have our crisis response team um, or bubbles as they're being called uh, around each provider and that is uh, social workers. Um, we are looking for support from our district nurses, from our health um, partners to look at their service but also to make sure that we are fully informed of each and every person and therefore if services can't be delivered, we know who these people are and we are able to respond appropriately. The review process across the partnership has been agreed and improved um, and this will ensure that the reviews for care at home services are based on functionality and risk with a clear and evidence base for decisions that are made. Um, and this fundamentally is, is when and Matt in particular is, is making sure that when we have to make really difficult decisions about who is going to get care or who will be left without care, we have a full picture of what that means in terms of the risk to the individual. Um, so that is being detailed and recorded and reviewed daily, if not hourly, to be fair, in some cases. We have uh, the integrated care community assessment and allocation team. So they meet daily to look at the full requirements of, of the uh, county of all the care that's required um, and make the very difficult decisions about where to um, allocate care. Bearing in mind this is talking about the community, we also need to be allocating care to get people out of hospital and to get people out of those interim care home beds. Um, so it's a, a very complex picture um, and we have to balance the needs of all those people that are waiting for care. We also increased the number of support plan brokers who are the people within the partnership that allocate and contract out to the independent sector. Uh, a slight positive, and Matt likes to tell me this is a big positive, and it is that our unmet need has remained relatively stable since April. Um, and this is the result of the stricter application of the criteria that I spoke about earlier, a better review and oversight of the capacity list, um, the ragging process um, of individuals and of the providers and of our ICAP model to capture system wide pressures. The increasing awareness that care at home is no longer the go to option for all social care needs. And this is something that we need to work on further with our colleagues and the um, other uh, public and, and um, the uh, our, our council colleagues and um, but you can see in figure two that it has somehow for all those if all that work that has been put in has met the unmet need has remained fairly constant so there are a number of areas that we are still working on um and I've listed them there. I think for, for me, it's the wider understanding with elected members and on the uh, and with the public on the availability availability of care at home and 
and that is being helped with the additional communication programme that we're putting in place. And um, following this meeting, there will be a briefing for the uh, elected members, and we will do a second communication out to our service users, and um, which follows on from the letter that we sent in, I think, September, just updating them on the current uh, situation and the things that we can do and they can do to support the current crisis. Uh, we do continue to try and develop the um, volunteer and community services, as Maureen pointed out earlier. We are looking and, and supporting our communities to try and develop um, and support um, the care at home crisis, but also make our communities more resilient and individuals to look elsewhere for support. Um, so Maureen's service, uh, we do have community uh, community care service it's called and um, where she is supporting a number of volunteers to train up to support some of um, the people who will not be receiving care at home but do still need either a short-term kind of intervention of um, reducing social isolation or connecting them in with different um, community groups community kitchen etc that are available um, we are developing um, a process should we require to temporarily stop care to people who have substantial needs. Um, this process will measure the risk management of cases and review the individuals whose care has stopped or been reduced. So that is very much being developed um, and being documented um, to, to ensure we are managing the risks. Um, I think there was maybe one or two. Um, just to touch back on Richard's point about the increasing of our internal care at home provision. So um, I think there's, there's two aspects there. It's not only increasing, trying to increase the number of carers available, but also the background management and recruitment of that is very resource intensive. And we did manage over the um, last couple of months to get more locum staff involved um, or, or recruited, but that was very labour intensive, very difficult for our current um, care at home services to get in place and to use effectively. And it reminds us of the importance of having um, coordinators and um, recruitment support to make sure that these people uh, are recruited and then well looked after once in post. Uh, I talked briefly just about the engagement we're doing with Cares of East Lothian and Vissel. Um, I've mentioned also the communication, we'll do uh, wide communication with the public and um, the uh, elected members. Um, and just a reminder, uh, we're also working with the Care Inspectorate, um, trying to get their support and, and buy-in to, to what we are doing and, and monitoring our risk process. Um, and just to note that this is also um, noted in detail on the uh, Partnerships Risk Register. And that's the paper. Any questions? Laura, thank you very much. Obviously, painting um, a relatively challenging picture. To use that word instead of the other one I was going to use. Um, <laughs> challenging is probably the right way to describe it because every efforts are clearly focused on trying to improve it, uh, which shall continue. I've absolutely no doubt with that. But we've got a couple of people lined up for questions. We've got Flora, then Shireen, and then Richard. Please. Thank you, and thank you, Laura, for for setting all of that out. I've seen the letter from John Swinney today talking about the um, different arrangements for social care and social work staff in relation to self-isolation. Um, and that can obviously be quite confusing. So the first question was, how are we and our providers making sure that staff understand uh, what, what the regulations are? And the second question was about uptake of the booster. I saw some figures today which said that 47.7% of frontline social care workers currently have taken up the booster and 54.8% of care home workers. Now, that's obviously really concerning if it, for their well-being and safety, but also to kind of keep as many people as possible delivering the service. So what are we doing locally? I understand the Scottish Government are making money available to providers so that they can give staff off. So just to know, do we know what our booster rates are in East Lothian and what are we doing to encourage people to take up the offer of the booster? Thank you. Thanks, Fiona. Um, the 
this, I suppose in the vaccination, probably wants to call, call on Alison to come in. I, uh, we have seen the, the uh, well, first of all, we've seen the letters that have come in um, with regards to the, the changes on um, self-isolation if you're your care homes or, or social care staff and um, so that is passed out to all our providers they obviously receive that information to you and on a voluntary basis their staff can comply or not and um, so we've passed out that information and um, that will be discussed and, and we if we see an increase in people requiring to isolate we can discuss that with each individual provider as we meet with them but yes we've certainly passed on that information and um, with regards to the vaccinations yes i can see the i saw the same paper, I think that, that maybe you're quoting. Um, th yeah, as Alison said earlier, we're really challenged by delivering the vaccination um, I, I, and how we can get that more people vaccinated quicker. Um, we're obviously making it as, as available as we possibly can. Um, I'm not sure I, we could do some work here about finding out um, the uptake of the booster for our independent sector and if they were struggling i've only had one provider come to me to say they were struggling to access actually it was the flu vaccination not the covid vaccination um we haven't had so in the first round we did have care at home providers struggling to access the vaccination i haven't had that from our care at home providers this time and um, which does make me think that they are maybe accessing it um already I'm also I pleased that the there is... Sorry, I'll just come in very quickly and say yep. the priority portals when they opened up, Fiona, made it much easier yeah. for providers um, to, to access it. And certainly Krista's been quite responsive if, if there's been a specific issue. So she hasn't she hasn't highlighted any issues with East no. Lothian. Um, and we've had good take up generally across the board. So um, I will double check that and come back to you if there's any issues on it. Yeah. And I think that the money is welcome as well if they weren't doing that already. Um, yeah, it's a welcome offer. Is that yeah, enough? Sure. Yeah. Uh, Shamine, please. Thank you. Just say firstly, thanks, Laura, for the paper. And it was just three, three points I wanted to make. One was around your, you know, you said about keep listening, and I just I, I wanted to hold this back for your your paper, which was at the COSLA meeting, also raised the, the level of £10, two pence and asked what, what difference, wanted to find out what difference that will make around other areas as well. And I think there was acknowledgement that, you know, it would have to be a minimum of 12 or up to £15 to make a real significant difference. And there was comment made of, of COSLA um, carrying out an audit. And I said I was quite keen to find out what the outcome of the audit would be and what difference that, that would make. Um, so just on to the, the, the previous paper, but linking into yours, you, you say one of the contributing factors, and you're right, is poor terms and conditions, and the amount that's set, that's a, that's a national agreement, and we can't, we don't have any flexibility in that. So if we, if you and your team thought actually we want to raise it to fifteen pound or or, or a, an aid or a level that you thought would make a difference um, to to us, I, I, I'm not 100% sure if we have the flexibility to do that or if we did want to do that if there's a mechanism for us to to go down a route if you thought that would make a difference for us and in a crisis situation you would take every avenue and route that you could do to be able to do that and chair just the the third final point is that um laura you mentioned that one of the contributing factors is care staff feeling undervalued and um, especially as a response to the pandemic resulting in staff leaving the sector and i just wondered chair, if, if we're able to include in there that IJB acknowledges a valuable contribution that the health and social care staff are, are making to support people through an extremely challenging time, especially in the care at home service. Yeah, more, more than happy to do that. Um, Shemeen, thanks for bringing that out. Laura, do you address the first two points? Um, so I think it was just the, the second point in can we can we raise up to 12 to 15 pounds? Um, it, it, so it would be... Uh, so we don't we haven't been given the money to do that and therefore we I, I, we can discuss this uh, we couldn't afford to do that so it's on a recurring basis so we we couldn't afford to go up to to constantly pay 12 pounds and then uplift again um so i think it's a finance uh, uh, yes it's it's even with that money that we've been given we couldn't simply passing it over to the providers to give the uplift um i, I think it, it for, so fi putting finances to one side, uh, I don't think that is the that would be the answer 
to the whole to to fix this problem. Um, it would only address the small number of people that we have in in East Lothian, and we would also have to reflect that against our internal provision. So I don't know. We could look at that. I I I just not sure it's it would solve the issue because there are other there are other things that are playing in the the the, the way that we manage and broker the care, the way that we. Um, uh, you know, there, there's the travel time aspect of that. We would want that addressed with with the terms and conditions, as well as the the, the cost of of the service, um, the, the provision of transport. We would want them to address that um, as a whole. So I'm not sure, Shamin. I don't think financially it's feasible, and I'm not sure giving the that it would work for an individual standalone organisation. For our larger organisations, such uh, as for our larger national organisations, they couldn't um, uplift just East Lothian without then uplifting their other, would be their argument, their other areas, because um, they have universal terms and conditions across the piece. I think it would be interesting, um, Laura, just to, to revisit this just conceptually at our finance yep. workshop, just, just, just to perhaps yep. tease out. Some things that maybe not maybe not able to go to the extent that she mean. I'm sure others would be supportive of she means. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. No, but, I think but, that would uh, be. There might be some things that we could explore that might be worth um, just talking through a bit more because Maureen's obviously raised the query around the viability of of the increase actually having any beneficial effect. It would be nice to know at some point whether or not it actually has demonstrated any movement at all. Uh, or it's just held our heads above the water, if you like, if, if, if that's the best way to describe it. But um, some analysis of this further down the line, I think, would be helpful. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think it would be helpful to look at that modelling um, further. And I, I entirely agree that £10 and two pence is not sufficient. Um, but it's, yeah, it's whether we have the power or the, the financial ability to, to make a significant difference ourselves. And I don't think ourselves as a standalone partnership we do um, to make it worthwhile. I think the fact that we've noted, um, I'm sure we have more comments in a minute, you know, we've, we've captured a view from the VCEL chief officer. So I think we can note that in the minute and that perhaps is something we can refer back to at a later stage if that's appropriate. Alison, did you want to come in yeah, at this point? Or, yeah. Sorry, yeah, just very briefly, Peter, it's certainly a discussion we've had um, at the multi-agency gold, given the, the pressures across the four part Lothian partnerships, because we're, you know, when we've got together with um, NHS Lothian the council chief executives and chief officers to talk about um, the social care position across across um, across Lothian, and involved in that are Scottish Care and a number of um, different. Um, different um, stakeholders but really just saying what we don't want to do is get into a, a, a bidding war because we, we've suffered from that in the past where there's been slight differences across the border um, of you know East Mid Edinburgh and um, so I think we, we need to be you know we need to recognise that that we that, that the influence that if we did something like that it'd be good to do it as a, a wider system so that we're not we're not um, robbing from each other because that that's another another risk and also i think that you know when it comes to internal external absolutely agree that um there's place for both in the market i think we're east lothian what we've found over the last six months when things have got difficult we're in a really difficult position of only having eight percent of our our and our home care internal you take that to another partnership not that far from us and you're talking 60 40 or 50 50. So really, if somebody phones us on a Thursday or a Friday and says we can't go out, as Matt and uh, uh, you know and his team have have been faced with on numerous occasions over the last um, six months on a fr Thursday or a Friday, there's there's um, 16 people that can't get home care delivered on Saturday or Sunday. It doesn't leave us anywhere to go, and I think that's you know rather than rather than trying to you know to, to imbalance the market. It's about us having some way that we can respond in those situations because it's been, I have to say, at some points, really concerning the people that were leaving, um, you know, the people that w were not given the, the level of care that we would want to. So it's been, that's why we're, we're looking at that. It's not, absolutely appreciate that there's, there's a place for everybody. 
um, in this and it's about getting the balance right which is going to be where we, we have to have lots of discussion with um, stakeholders. Richard, do you mind if I just check do you this point is not on the same thing just before I come back to you? No, it's different, different matter. No, could I ask you if, if, if her point is on uh, this same topic? It is. Yeah, Richard, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll take you to then just so we can complete this item. OK, I really wanted just to come in in support of Alison. I mean, I am part of national conversations on a weekly basis with our chief social work officers. And uh, whilst everybody is facing pressures, I think we are we are in a, an additionally challenging position because we don't have as much flexibility as other areas do because of the balance. So I think Alison's point about the balance of internal versus external is something that um, you know, it needs to be top of our agenda because it's putting us at more pressure than other areas um, uh, because of the nature of it. Yeah. Thanks, thank Peter. You. Richard, thank you for your patience. Not at all. I even put the light on so you can see me better. <laughs> um, so once again, also like to thank you for the paper, uh, Laura. I think it you know clearly sets out all the work that's being done. It sets out, you know, really we're in difficult times and we're having to make difficult decisions. Um, you did you did say at one point that some of the decisions, some of the positions we're in are, are not ideal. And in fact, I, I would go a bit farther and say some of the decisions really are, are a significant risk. Um, we do know that one of the commonest causes for hospital admission is the breakdown in social care provision. And it does seem to me that what we're hearing here are, are really quite significant shifts in our approach, our assessment, our service delivery. And I just, it again shows my ignorance, I do apologise, but I just wonder why we feel an integrated impact assessment is not applicable. This, this strikes me to be almost a change in strategy. And I kind of wonder if an IIA might not be appropriate at this time. So, uh, yes, I think we need to look at that. It wasn't appropriate for the paper, but um, I think as we potentially look to change some of our policies, we might need to do an integrated impact assessment on those policies. So, yes, we'd agree, Richard, and um, yeah, it's something right. we need to look at. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. OK, I've got a couple, Laura, if I can, if everybody else is done. Um, how many of the additional uh, home facilitated care requirements are need to be nurse led as a proportion? So is it is it partly down to the fact that we need to shift the resource from where it is in the acute into the acuity, or is it that we need to employ more people that have got a different skill set to those currently working or, or a blended approach, if you like? To those currently working because the, the, the needs of the individuals are at a level that's higher than the current um, expectations of care provision that we've got available to us. Is that any relevance at all? That that point. Uh, so I don't. So it's not. I wasn't saying that people had still medical needs that required a nurse. I don't know if Alison wants to come in in the community, but uh, the 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 work or the the care that's required by our care home staff is not nurse nursing it but there is a clinical need for it and um, so it's more complicated than it maybe was before and um, it requires them to correctly and and this is right to to note clearly what's happened to to notice things that have changed um to notice somebody's deteriorating health um, and this is this is something that they are trained to do um but perhaps they're not given the time or this uh, enough training to make sure that, that it's completed correctly. So, I, sorry, I wasn't saying that we needed nursing going into the community in that way to replace our care at home service, more recognising that the skill level of our care at home staff has changed over the years because people have are at home without a medical need, but with, with needs. Yeah, I, I, I wasn't saying you'd say that, Laura. I was just, oh, checked, I was just testing my own understanding of it going forward. The reason I asked the question is that if, when Richard and I chat through this same issue in Edinburgh, not necessarily home-based, but uh, care home provision is being focused around a more nursing home type environment, 
which would suggest that the demands are moving towards that skill set more than they are the current skill set of those working in care in the community. So my question is, going forward, can we anticipate more nurses or the current skill set of nurses being required of a higher number than we've currently got? Because that's a key, that's a key strategic shift, if you like, in how the balance of care is provided of unmet need going forward. If the unmet need is of a higher level, how do we get the staff, nursing staff in there? Do you want me to come in on that, Laura? Yeah, yeah, yes, please. Um, Peter, I think you're, you're right, and and I would I would say if we were talking about care homes today, we would be having a different discussion rather than care at home, and it, it's an knock-on effect in that most pe people that we are seeing at home now are the people who ten five ten years ago would have been in care homes. People that were seen in care homes five ten years ago would have been in HB triple C. So you, you're you're looking after people, um, especially in care homes, um, who are potentially requiring a much higher level of nursing care. Now that's not to say that the carers in care homes haven't up, um, increased their training levels and they have on a number of occasions and are really quite highly skilled but sometimes we've got people especially when it gets to end of life who are needing um, specialised pain control, specialised treatments, peg feeds, you know just different things that are happening in a care home that wouldn't have happened in a care home. Um, five years ago. So from that perspective, we're also, uh, so Edinburgh might have um, said it, we'll be saying it, we, we're also looking in our council care homes at um, having nurses in the, based in the care homes to support, not, not to deliver all that care, but to support the carers who have, uh, who are well trained, but need that additional, um, that additional support. Now we're lucky in East Lothian that we've got the care home advanced practitioners already and um, which is you know is then available and um, works with the GP practice and works with the care homes so that that's that's a huge resource for the care homes themselves but actually we are looking to have um, nurses embedded in the services and certainly the last year with the pandemic or 20 months I keep thinking it's a year but I forget it's nearly two now and um, they the, the, the infection prevention and control, the donning, the doffing and all these things that have been brought into care homes. It's just having somebody there to, to support the staff um, with the different requirements. So I, I would think in care homes we are also moving towards that that model. Yeah, so I, I won't leave a point else about I'm, ju I'm just thinking for the directions that we think maybe in the coming months related to the financial workshop and how we would consider all that going forward. Maybe worth a further discussion. That, that's that's my, my, my main point. Uh, I've got a couple of others, but I'll, I'll I'll leave them perhaps for for a, a more detailed discussion with this. But th thank you, uh, Laura. Richard, is your hand still up, or have you got a question? No. Sorry, Peter. Okay. Are we are we all, all done on Laura's paper? I think we are. Um, thank you very much, Laura. I think in this instance there's no roll call required. We've just been asked to note. So I think we're duly noting all the issues you've raised. And thanks for um, pulling it all together as you've done, Laura. It's really informative for us to see it that way. So thank you for all your efforts. Okay, um, we now move on to uh, Chief Social Work Officer Annual Report. And uh, Judith, it's yourself. Thank you very much. <clears throat> And good afternoon, uh, colleagues. Pleased to present this annual report to the IJB of the Chief Social Work Officer for 2021. So the report fulfills the statutory requirement for uh, the Chief Social Work Officer to produce an annual report on the activities and performance of social work services in East Lothian. The IJB is asked to note the contents of the report and consider its implications for the provision of social work services in East Lothian and their role in assuring the welfare and safety of vulnerable adults and children across the country. The report sets out the governance and accountability arrangements for the strategic direction and operational delivery of services across children's justice adult social work services. It provides an overview of the role of the Chief Social Work Officer in the delivery of statutory functions and responsibilities and in providing assurance of sound social work practice. The time frame of this report broadly aligns to the first year of the COVID pandemic and charts the impact of three periods of lockdown to public and private life. It sets out the reality of delivering social work services within the context of a pandemic where the public's concern with risk and vulnerability, the core business of social work, 
was heightened and more visible than ever before, yet with severe limits to the capacity of services to meet the expectations of keeping people safe. In short, every aspect of how we deliver social work and social care was affected. For a profession that is centred on relationships and using these relationships to help people change, cope with adversity, provide care and support, and provide safely towards each other and themselves, uh, it's been impacted on more than from any others. Our social work and social care workforce must be commended for their dedication and commitment um, during such challenging circumstances, and I thank them for this. The report highlights a number of key achievements and progress in modernising business services that were delivered despite the pandemic. During 2020-21, we learnt much about how we can successfully find solutions at the local level and work across our service boundaries. We've seen the value of universal services and providing the bedrock of support to our citizens and the impact of their absence or reduced access on the role of children, parents, carers and adults who rely on and require our services. As we know from the conversations we've had already this afternoon, while some aspects of public life are moving through recovery and renewal, key areas of social work and social care are either at a very early stage or remain firmly in response mode. The cumulative impact of the pandemic on the physical, emotional, mental health and well-being of vulnerable people and their families continues to emerge. Statutory social work and social care will be required to adapt to ensure we support the recovery, the rising demand and renewal associated with protecting and caring for our most vulnerable citizens and all those at risk in our communities. We are embarking on a period of potentially significant change for social work and social care and maintaining stability across these services in this time of flux and uncertainty will be essential. Chair, I hope this annual report does justice to the breadth and range of work carried out by our social work staff. And once again, I thank them for their commitment. I'm happy to take questions, although it's some time since I wrote this report, so I may have to come back to people if they have particular queries. Um, but I have other colleagues with me here today who I'm sure can help as well. Thank you. Thanks, Judith. I think we, we'd all wish to acknowledge the point you've made around the contribution that uh, social work and social care staff have, have made. So it's often the, the one that's least said. So I think on this occasion, we, we should repeat your words uh, and, and thank them for all they've done in that period and uh, the period beyond. So, so thank you for the report. Are there any questions uh, for Judith on this report? Can I, can I ask a question? And, and Judith, I, I note you, you speak a bit about uh, the training of staff and the pipeline that's required to get people through into the qualified status. From my understanding from elsewhere, that's been a particular challenge. Is that, is that something that you've been able to overcome? I think we're working really hard now that we've got, um, you know, a, a kind of senior workforce development officer firmly in place and really looking to kind of strengthen the journey through through placements and, and, and recruiting students. We need to have a good offer for our students. We want them to come and have a good experience. We want them to come and stay in East Lothian. So I know that, um, you know, that, that key officers are working um, kind of firmly on that and trying to take a joint approach across children um, and adult services and also to work with our partners in neighbouring authorities to kind of maximise the opportunities of, um, you know, a kind of shared support arrangements for really developing our, our newly qualified cohort and, uh, uh, and kind of helping them through the, the base. So it's something we've got a keen eye on. It's really hard at the moment to find capacity for, 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 st for student placements and support when, 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 when staff are absolutely up against it, because it's, it's often additionality to the job, but we absolutely recognise that we need to nurture, we need to encourage, we need to, um, you know, people need to want to come and work with us in East Lothian. And I know that's high on the list of priorities for our uh, workforce development staff. I think Alison wants to come in on that. Yeah, I, thanks, Judith. I just wanted to add, and, and Matt and Judith might say a wee bit more about um, the fact that we, we are working with IRIS to look at the social work um, journey in East Lothian and the experience of social workers. So um, a national um, team that are um, working with us on the development of the social work role so that um, we can see areas we may require to invest in, some training opportunities um, as we move 
move through um, the, the, the coming year. So quite a bit of um, work going on to see how we can improve and build on some of the um, some of the developments that have been in East Lothian. So really pleased that they're doing that. The, the, if you've seen the comment from um, from Mori, if you wish to uh, offer any response to it, can you see that in the chat? Yes, so my understanding would be that, you know, that the social work courses will offer place, student placements within the third sector. Um, it, I'm not sure that, that those are placements that we would have oversight over from the council perspective, um, but I don't know whether Matt wants to come in um, on the back of that. Uh, yeah, well, I was just actually going to confirm that we, um, as Judith was saying, we have been um, looking very closely at the offer for social work students uh, and the universities are certainly very keen that we are able to um, offer um, placements. So I think we've potentially got four or five already lined up from um, January 2022. So I think there is definitely, as you just said, a challenge around how that how we make that a, a really positive experience for everybody involved in very difficult circumstances, but we definitely have planned through 2022 for that to be a different uh, experience than it was in, in the last couple of years, which is very, very difficult. Um, and then just on Alison's point, we are kind of in the first quarter of a, of a journey with IRIS, which is the Institute of uh, Innovation and Research for Social Services in Scotland, and uh, they're working very closely with us, but particularly our frontline staff to actually hear from them um, the experience of, of working within social work service in East Lothian specifically uh, and what we can do to make that better for them but also improve the system um, and m make it a better experience for service users ultimately. So we're really trying to take an approach that actually if it's a good place to work and things are managed properly and work the way that we want them to then it's going to be a better experience for the people that uh, matter to us most and come to our door every day. So um, that's a work that is now firmly in track and hope maybe report back here at some point later in 22. Um, and in terms of Maureen's point, I, I, that is maybe a more challenging one that we maybe have some discussion with outside of here, but uh, how we incorporate lots of different uh, opportunities for people in education, not just social work, professional practice. Thanks for that, Matt. Appreciate you coming in there. Um, Shireen, you've got a question. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, thanks very much, Judith. This is a really um, useful report. It just gives it, there's a huge plethora of information there, and I think it's a real um, good way of seeing all the work that's happened over the end, the, the wide red right, uh, right across from adult resource centres to learning disability service to day centres to um, just the social work. So I think it's it's really valuable. It just outlines the, the uh, breadth of work that's happened but I just wanted to touch upon the adult social work activity data and in 2021 you see kind of year on year that, that we see an increase in the number of referrals and I just wondered if you're seeing any um, trends for, for for this year or is it too early to be able to to say but you, from, from your table you can see on referrals we're seeing a, a, a year on year increase yeah, Shamine, so this is on page 55 of our papers. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I'll give Laura a little bit of time to gather her thoughts. I think I think it'd be very difficult <laughs> looking at me. I think it'd be very difficult to uh, compare this 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 last year um, in terms of, uh, you know, I, I just think that, that unfortunately for our data in terms of referrals and assessments, it'll be quite skewed by by the pandemic and the experiences of that. So something we are um, we are very mindful of data. And as you'll have seen from the from from Laura's previous report, we are kind of um, kind of careful carefully monitoring that where we can. Some of our, our, our data points will not be helpful for us to kind of compare with other years. But um, I don't know, Matt, whether you want to come in to um, add any colour to that? Yeah, I was just, uh, I think you're right, Judith. It's going to be very difficult to compare 2019 to 2020 to 2021 because the challenges in each are different. Um, but I think what we are, I suppose, there's nothing like a crisis to focus the mind and actually probably what we are doing, I think as well as we possibly can just now, is manage our all of our resource. So that's the social work response, um, be it care at home, waiting list, et cetera. So actually, even in probably some of the most difficult 
set of circumstances we've seen in the last year and a half, two years for this part of the service, um, it's really helping us to um, think very clearly about where we need to prioritise our work and what we're doing. So ironically, what we are seeing is, as Laura talked about in her paper, we're beginning, we're actually I'm managing our unmet need and I hope that the work we're doing there will continue to see that not just be managed but actually reduce so that we're able to redirect um, people and signpost them to services that appropriately meet their need and not just getting stacked up in a waiting list here where people are essentially disingenuously being placed on waiting list that um, we just have a big bag of risk that we're not that we haven't been able to keep on top of previously and the other part of that is um, our actual waiting list for social care assessments we are seeing that coming down now it's taken it's been really difficult to get to that point but we are beginning to see the early shoots of uh, our ability to manage waiting lists and that is all goes back to that work with iris about being safe and effective and responsive as, as a service and not just uh, sort of saying actually a waiting list is a big problem that nobody wants to tackle so th i think the clarity of mind that the current crisis is forcing us to have is beginning to show actually for the future we'll be in a better place. The the rapid pace at which it's all happening is what's making it really, really difficult to respond to and is increasing that level of risk that people have talked about. But actually the changes that we're undergoing are ones that we had set out to do, but we want to do them over three years, not three months. So it's really um but beginning to see some improvement in those areas. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Start to be Maureen, you, you want to come in? Yes, sorry. I, I suppose it's, it's a, a wee bit of throwing, throwing the bomb in rather than, than being constructive, but you're talking about unmet need there. Is that because people just aren't coming to you for services? I mean, do you know what I mean? COVID, before pre-COVID, there was unmet need and everybody had an idea that, oh yes, we've got this unmet need in, in our communities and all the rest of it. But actually what COVID did was highlight that there was actually more unmet need than ever before, or that we'd ever recognise. Is it a case now that actually you're meeting the, the waiting lists or, or what you think is the unmet need, but not actually really covering the unmet need because people are hiding it again? Laura, you taking that? Oh, Laura, you got it. Yeah. Oh, Matt, it's just, yeah. Sorry. I was just gonna say, I think um, that, specifically that is the unmet care at home need so um there may be there's probably lots of ways of, of uh measuring and understanding unmet need but that as with what i'm talking about is specifically the care at home bit um we i, I think that we can't get away from the escape it's uh, sorry the, i can't escape the fact that it's about managing it so there may be that if we had just continued in the same way that we were before we'd probably be looking at an unmet need that would be twice that so i we, at the end of the day, we have a finite care, well, not even finite, a decreasing care at home resource. Um, and certainly one way of delivering that in a safe way is, is managing the demand around it. So I think your question is totally right, Maureen, that there probably is uh, an increased level of, I have as an individual, a level of support that I require, um, but we need to find a different way of delivering that and not simply adding it on to an unmet care at home need that then becomes something that's so big that actually we can't manage it and we're not responding to people and it, we just end up with this um, big long list of, of names that actually becomes a, a really scary uh, place for us. So it's, it's really trying to contain that and make sure we're focusing the resource we do have on those who need it most and hopefully been able to deliver um, and meet needs in, in other ways for the for the other unmet needs, but not just simply care at home. And I think that's 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 fine with for the care at home because it is you're being very specific, but actually there's there's a whole you know there's communities out there that actually have got unmet need that I don't think that we really know about yet, and I don't think we'll know in the next six months or the next year. And I think it's just as a kind of checks and balances that care at home is certainly an issue, but actually we've probably got a plethora of unmet need that's not care at home coming up behind it. Maybe a, few just... people, a few other people want to come in, so if, if we can, Matt, maybe we'll let... Shumin, is your point on this very same thing? 
Chair, my point's been covered. Okay, so I think it was Laura, Judith, and then John Turnbull. That was the order in which the hands were put. Does that work for everybody? Go on, so, Laura. It was quickly just to say, uh, just following from Matt's point, I suppose the unmet need, and I suppose a lot of what we're doing now is about recognising, as you keep telling us, Maureen, the importance of our communities and the importance of people not coming to social care too early um, and us being better at preventing that escalating need. Um, and I think we are getting better at that, and that's shown on our unmet need graph. But yeah, the importance of, look, we can recognise this early, the community are picking this up, there are some services in place already, not statutory services, but communities coming together to deliver stuff that's going to help people and prevent them coming to care at home and prevent them needing a social work assessment and then being put on a list for care at home that isn't going to address their needs anyway. So the importance for me is absolutely, as you say, looking, steering people earlier, getting them yeah, don't come to social care because actually your needs can be met by your community or elsewhere because your needs aren't yet at a level that requires a social work input. That's yeah, just what I want to tell. That, that, that's, a, that's a difficult balance to strike, Laura. I'm sure it's right. Conceptually, it's right. Judith? I think Maureen's absolutely right. And I deliberately said in my kind of introduction that, that, that the impacts and the latent impacts of this are yet to be understood or known or even manifest themselves. So we are seeing in some service areas, not just that people's needs have increased because they've not had a kind of level of care they may have needed, but the, you know, the impact of the length of time those stresses have been around for them, then make that need greater now. So, you know, whilst at the start of the pandemic, there was a, there was a, a sense of um, you know, people would, would get through this um, and, and, you know, would want to come through the, the other side. I think that fatigue, the exhaustion, we talked about learning disability care at home services. We are seeing families of children with complex needs who, who are close to cracking. Um, and, when, and when they go, that's an extremely expensive and complex package of care that, that we'll need to put in place. So I think thing that we need to have on our agenda is how are we going to learn to capture and articulate what that new different unmet need actually looks like how are we going to understand what it is that is going to be people are going to be living with um, and are going to need some support with who provides the support is another entirely different conversation as as we've said and we're already in the realm of saying to families you're going to have to do more than you were doing. Um, and that's an uncomfortable position to be in, but it's 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 reality for us because there, there, there are no alternatives. And I'm not sure when those alternatives are going to be back at a level that we can rely on. Um, so I think how we capture the need, how we understand what our need is in our own communities is going to be something that's really important for us. Yeah, it's good points. Judith, John, last word for you. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, it's a really interesting discussion and this thing about understanding the level of need and the unmet need and so on is uh, is quite difficult. Um, but I was reflecting as a working GP, uh, my own experience in people's homes and, and that of colleagues like district nurses, you know, it's not that we haven't got people out there seeing um, people with and without home care support. And quite often my experience is, is actually encouraging uh, families to come forward um, for an assessment at least of what their, the, the person's care needs are. Now, obviously we're not about to raise expectations in the current situation uh, beyond what's reasonable, but there often seem to be people who, who clearly need some help in order to keep going um, and that's not withdrawal of, of family support. It's it's a bit of help alongside it, um, uh, and and I think that's that's a factor too. You know, we 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 can't um, let go of our responsibility to intervene and support where it's needed in order to sustain a, a situation. Thank you, John, for that uh, contribution. Um, I'm not seeing any other hands, so I'm, I'm going to assume that we've, um, we've asked all the questions we want to in this one. And again, we're just being asked uh, to note, so there's no roll call required. And thank you, Judith, and everybody else who took part in that discussion. I'm sure there's more discussions to be had 
particularly on the uh, learning development front that you spoke about and Maureen's uh, thinking along those lines. And if you're all, um, all outside of this meeting, maybe there'd be some useful additional discussions that could that could help facilitate some of the comments that have been made in the chat. So thank you all for your contributions there. And we'll move on to the final item for today, which is the East Lothian Community Hostels and Care Home Provision Change Board update. Uh, is it yourself, Bruce? It is. Thank you, Peter. It was, we said, as part of the Community Hospitals and Care Homes Provision Change Board, we would just bring some updates as and when to the IGB. So this is just really a, an update um, to the board, just on a couple of items, really. So just to recap under background of the paper very quickly that we established the change board and we've set up three working groups uh, looking at communications and engagement capacity and planning, uh, which is looking at the care home bed capacity and the community hospitals bed capacity and then finance and capital. So across the um, change board overall, we've had five meetings and each of the working groups have had various meetings too and development takes place in each of those groups. Let, let, less so with finance and capital as they really wait on the direction from capacity and planning work that's taking place. Um, under assessment, there's a number of pieces of work that uh, we've highlighted there that's taken place over the past few months in terms of work and engagement that we've undertaken to date. We've also uh, provided some uh, communications briefings out to the community and across a, a range of stakeholders. We have finalised our stakeholder map. We have developed our web page uh, for ongoing continuous briefings and updates and that's also something we did three years ago and is very positive and very helpful. Uh, we've attended some of the health and wellbeing group meetings at Dunbar and made links into the North Berwick Health and Wellbeing Association. I think it's just looking at planning some meetings there but been working with the chairs and updating them through the uh, uh, planning team links that we have through their officers. Um, a couple of the smaller points is that the change board has requested that meetings take place every couple of months rather than six weekly as was. So we'll start that from January and uh, that means the next meeting will be in March. That in itself doesn't make a great deal of difference other than it timing uh, the impact that that will have with the, the election in May and the pre-election period. So what we've got to do is adjust our timetable. Uh, of work that takes place and bring some pieces of work up to the March meeting of the change board. We won't be looking for any final decisions to be made at that meeting. What we will be providing is some initial recommendations on next steps being drafted for the meeting in April. Um, and we're aware that with the pre-election period we would not make any decision making or any impactful work at that point. There'll be work going on in the background and we then hope to come back to the change board subsequently in June or July when we get those booked in. And at that point we'll be looking for some decisions about proceeding to consultation and engagement process which would take place over the summer. So whilst there's still a lot of work ongoing around that comms and engagement with the various groups, the actual more formalised process would take place across June, July and August with a subsequent report going to the change board in October and then back to the IJB around about November and December. This was before anything in terms of the announcements that might impact on, on uh, staff and services with Omicron etc. So we'll have to bear that in mind but that was an already tight agenda is all I'd say at this point. Uh, so really part of it was around the impact of the Scottish elections in May 2022, so we needed to take account of that. And secondly, staff and pressures over the winter period. Uh, and as I said, that was me writing that prior to the Omicron impact and what that does, because part of it is we need to speak to uh, clinical staff, staff who are in those services and with the uh, best will in the world, their focus isn't on me or some of my colleagues trying to contact them about planning some of these services when they've got other pressures ongoing, though um, they do their very best. But I think it's just worth highlighting that. And we've highlighted that as a risk in our change board as well. So with those 
two elements having a bit of a direction and the actions that we've identified and worked on to date. It's really just for the IJB to note three things, the actions that were undertaken within the change board, to note those timeline changes, which although only that six weeks period can impact about three to four months of a timeline, and just to note that uh, continuous and ongoing pressure on staff as a result of impact of COVID-19, et cetera, and the service impacts. And again, I keep saying that that was right as prior to Omicron, so this was even pressure prior to that point. So happy to take any questions on that paper. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Bruce. Yeah, any questions for Bruce on what he's described to you? Shireen. Um, thanks, Bruce, for your paper. Do you think you might be in a position where you might have to come back to look at those time scales again, considering the announcements made by the First Minister and um, the prevalence of Omicron? Yeah, th thanks, Shamin. Um I think, yes, we will have to keep on board the uh, the timeline and the impact. As I said, when we wrote this, this was prior to that, and this makes, and even then, we're thinking it's very tight. This is a very tight timeline to achieve. If we can get everything lining up and the meetings lining up, that would be good. Um, in terms of the impact with uh, teams for vaccinations, the impact on staffing, then it could impact. So we will take and continue to take note of that um, and come back to the next meeting in March. But if we needed to, we'd speak to both uh, Peter as chair and Alison as vice chair in the meantime, if we needed to make any interim changes to that timeline. Thank you. Alison, did you take your hand down? I did. I basically totally agree, Bruce. I think that there are a number of um, an issue, a number of undertakings that the partnership have ongoing at the moment that might be affected. Um, she mean by by the current situation that's changing by an hourly basis, let alone a daily basis. But we will keep keep um, the board up updated as we move forward. Thanks for that. Thanks, Alison. <clears throat> Any other questions or comments? Um, you've already read out what we've been asked to note, Bruce, so I won't repeat that, so I'm just assuming that, that we were, were all happy to note the three areas that Bruce has highlighted to us. So if we are, uh, thank you very much for that. Um, thank you, Peter. As is always the case, we're asked to all mute our microphones before we now switch off the recording, so if, if you haven't done that,